Hi, Jeff. How are you doing? And welcome. I'm doing great. Thank you. All right. So I guess we're doing uh, more of a Q&A session than a presentation. It's going to be a combination. I'm going to talk, but I want everyone to know that I'm very interested in answering questions um, because some people have heard me before and want to have follow up on something that may be stuck in their mind. And some people haven't heard me, in which case I might be going way advanced compared to what they need to know about the basics of GMOs. So we have the time. So um, I'm going to speak on a few things here and there. And uh, but I'm also going to be um, asking people to ask me their questions by raising their hand at a certain point and several times throughout the two hours. All right, great. And just so everybody knows how to how to raise the hand, raise their hand. Um, in order to do so, on the, the second button from the right at the bottom of the Zoom, there, there's a button called Reactions. You're going to click on that, and then from there, you will select Raise Hand, um, and then uh, Jeff will be able to see that you've raised your hand, and then he'll unmute you, and you can ask your question. All right, so you can go ahead, and and you want to start off by, you know, kind of giving a prelude to the to the topic, and then sure, perfect. All right, hi everyone, hello. I've, this is, I've been doing the uh, Real Truth About Health since the very first uh, year, and um, it's exciting to be part of this, and I know that there's more people who are going to see this after today and when it gets repurposed and sent out. But for those who are here now, you know that it's Mother's Day, and so I want to start by speaking to Mother's Day. Um, with GMOs, it's an interesting thing in that you can avoid the mother. You can create new organisms without sexual intercourse, without uh, you know, birds and the bees. You can create new organisms uh, that, that don't resemble sexual reproduction. And in that sense, you're taking over a very important job. Um, now, when one of the things that I think about in terms of mothering, uh, Mother's Day is the mothering instinct of animals and humans, and it's a precious, natural, uh, important part of biology and of life. And I remember my friend um, from the Center for Food Safety uh, tell me that the early attempts for genetic engineering, one of them was to genetically engineer out the mothering instinct, to eliminate the mothering instinct of livestock so that you could take their babies away and they won't care. And this was um, to Andy Kimbrell, who told me this, an example of the most, one of the most egregious things that we can do with genetic engineering is to eliminate the mothering instinct. And it certainly is a huge violation of natural law, in my opinion, uh, as is a lot of aspects of industrial agriculture. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the mothering piece for a second because of Mother's Day. And then we're going to jump into uh, deeper knowledge about GMO 2.0. In fact, we're going to start with the microbiome right now. The importance of a healthy microbiome in the infant which is the bacteria and other microbes throughout the body of the, of the infant, but particularly in the gut and within that, particularly in the large intestine. It is so important that when it is properly established, it helps that child's health for the rest of their life and can be passed on to future generations. If a child has a C-section, Often the health is compromised because the child gets inoculated with certain microbes in the birth canal during the birthing process. In fact, in the second trimester, milk digesting bacteria move into the birth canal. And that is one of the things that inoculates the infant so that they can digest milk, so that their microbes can digest milk. And part of the milk from the mother during breastfeeding is not designed for the infant. 
It is indigestible by the infant. It stays intact through the stomach, through the small intestine to feed the microbes in the large intestine. So we have evolved as a species to provide microbes for the infant, to nourish the microbes of the infant, and more microbes come through the milk from the mother, and more microbes come from the nipple on the skin, so maybe 28% of the of the microbes in the in the gut of the infant come from the milk about 10 percent from the nipple some come from the birthing process all fed by the by the part of the milk that is not designed to feed the infant but it gets even more interesting when the infant gets sick somehow the milk changes to support the sick infant how does that happen because the microbes in the saliva of the infant change and feedback through the breast to the mother's microbiome and that changes the nature of the milk to support the health of the baby. It's absolutely incredible, but less so when we realize that we are not just human individuals, we have a community inside us that has co-evolved with us for as long as humanity has evolved. And we can get away with a measly 23,000 genes. Be that's less than an earthworm. Because we use the microbiome information of the 3.5 million genes and the microbes living inside us. And we've also outsourced a lot of the daily metabolic and chemical functions to the microbiome. Maybe uh, Kiran Krishnan, who's an expert at the human microbiome, he, he thinks about 90%. There are things that we can't do that only the microbes inside of us can do. They can tell if there's a particular cell that needs to be repaired along the gut walls. We have no way of knowing that except for the microbes living inside us. Dr. Dietrich Klinghart tells me that when they reduce the amount of microbiomes of the bacteria and, and bugs in our brain, yes, they're in our brain, our IQ goes down. How is it that the bugs in our brain support intelligence. There's a programming in the microbes that we don't understand. And it is so intelligent, it carries in many ways the imprint or the blueprint or the current reading of the health of our body. So much so, some of you don't know about this, there's a technique called fecal transplant. Yes, it's exactly what you just thought. It's done with rats and mice and humans. And I'll give you a story that my friend Dr. David Perlmutter told me. He said there was a 12-year-old boy, I think it was 12-year-old, who was autistic, could hardly speak. He ran into the mother at, in a parking lot and ended up engaging in a conversation. And he told her, he recommended a fecal transplant. You take fecal matter from a healthy person and put it in a suppository in a specific way, and she decided to go forward with it. They did it in England. Two weeks later, the 12-year-old boy was speaking in full sentences. He showed me a picture when I was visiting him in his house, this is David Perlmutter, of a, of a rat, I don't know if it's a rat or a mouse, exhibiting autistic symptoms, and they did a fecal transplant from a healthy animal, and those went away. Sometimes after a fecal transplant, people get heavy or thin. It turns out that the nature of the bacteria living inside us can dictate how heavy or thin we are. It can dictate, if the bacteria and the microbiome inside us can tell us 
to desire a cupcake because it needs sugar. It can tell us to desire social interaction because it wants more microbial diversity. And if, it, if we do something that it wants, it can stimulate the reward center and train us to be supporters of its community. The microbes make the happy chemical precursors, L-tryptophan and tyrosine, are produced by the microbes inside of us, which then become serotonin and dopamine. And the serotonin becomes melatonin. So it produces happy chemicals. And if we understand the microbes, that's micro Jedi army that's working inside us, we get to appreciate it and love it. If a woman has breast cancer, certain type of bacteria moves into the breast. They thought it was a bad thing. They killed the bacteria. The cancer spread. It was to contain certain fungi move into the brain during Alzheimer's to help protect the brain. We don't realize how much support we are getting from this unseen kingdom, kingdoms. But it's not just inside us. It's also in the soil. A healthy microbial system can produce healthy, nutrient-rich crops that can resist disease and don't need chemicals for survival. The microbes draw down the carbon from the air, often through the plants. Microbes can condense water vapor in the atmosphere to create rain. They can align um, water molecules and refrigerate them so they can become snow or frost at higher temperatures. There are extremophiles that live inside volcanoes and at the bottom of the depths of the ocean. Using laws of nature, we don't fully understand. Now, what's interesting about the microbes is that unless we do something, Genetic engineering could begin to destroy the microbiomes inside of us, in the soil, in the atmosphere. You see, Mike, we already said a fecal transplant, just a small amount of fecal matter from a different person or a different animal can change the nature of a person's health. Slight changes of, in the microbiome from antibiotics or the addition of certain probiotics can make significant changes. In fact, it's the changes in the microbes inside of us that can give rise to 80% of the diseases we face, according to Karen Krishnan. 80%. You can find their source, among other things, as the changes in the microbiome. Now, we're, let's talk about genetic engineering in terms of genetically engineering microbes. And for those that have a pen and paper, I'd like you to write down this website, responsibletechnology.org slash take action. Responsibletechnology.org slash take action. We'll come back to that. So if you, genetic, if you genetically engineer a microbe and you put it outside, take it for a walk, first of all, they replicate very fast. The numbers are stunning. The numbers are so big, it's hard to really put them into perspective. Some will die in the, in the environment, but some will survive. Then they can travel. We did not need a pandemic to know that microbes can travel. In fact, my friend, Dr. Elaine Ingham, tells me that she was approached by whistleblowers at the EPA. They told her that they did a study to see how far genetically engineered bacteria would travel. So they created some nitrogen fixing bacteria genetic, through genetic engineering, released it in a field in Louisiana and set up monitoring stations. They found it at least 11 miles away the next year, another 11 miles the next year. They stopped funding the study at some point, but members of the EPA 
who were curious and concerned, they continued to monitor for the presence of this genetically engineered bacteria. And it turns out they eventually found it everywhere they checked, all over the planet. So if you release a genetically engineered microbe, it might go everywhere. And it contains changes in its genetic code, possibly in its activity, possibly in, the, in its byproducts that it creates, possibly in its interactions, that have never co-evolved with us. And it may change the way a pretty critical microbe functions, one that may be important for our health, important for the soil, important for the algae, which produce 70% of the Earth's oxygen, or the fungi networks underneath, underneath forest floors that shuttle nutrients between mother trees and other trees, speaking of Mother's Day, and can help the young trees that are not yet above the canopy, they're not getting any sunlight, but they're getting the nutrients from the trees that are at the canopy because it's transferred through fungal networks. <laughs>